Hi everybody, it's Stephen Brook and welcome to Architectural Photography and Composition. We're going to talk about photo merge and how you can make really wide views. Now, if you've been doing this work for any period of time, I know you have come up against a couple of these situations. One is where you have a long, low-rise building with limited ability to back up and the problem is it's very easy if you use your widest lens to get a skinny little building and you can't see any details so that that's one problem another one is if you have a really tall interior and if you put a wide angle lens on that you're going to get really distorted um, the architecture is going to be really distorted overhead, not enough room to back up, let's say, and zoom in like we've talked about. And then the last situation is one I have run into on more than one occasion where I have to shoot a skyline, the distant skyline, something that's a couple of zip codes away. And it's really wide and again if I put a wide angle lens on it I get this skinny little line of buildings and you can barely see anything so what is our way around this how can we get good wide panoramic views first let's take a, a look back there are panoramas have been around a long time um, this is a, a Dutch painter this is a this is a folly this isn't real but this is a panorama with the abduction of Helen amidst the wonders of the ancient world but this is a pretty wide view that he's painted here notice he's using atmospheric perspective as you get further and further away the blues and greens um, recede from your eye and the warmer colors come towards you. This is uh, Gaspar de, uh, Van Vitel, we used to call him uh, Gaspar Van Vitelli. He spent a lot of time in Italy and this is a pretty wide angle view of Florence he took in the late 17th century. Notice he uses a lot of the techniques that we've discussed. He has repressoire elements, a big vertical here. Part of the foreground is in shadow, makes this L shape to, to counterbalance this horizontal thrust. Here's a view of Istanbul, 1773, de Favet. And again, this is a really wide view. So like I say, panoramas have been around for a while. Now, the Hudson Valley, if you've ever been there, just asks for panoramic views. It is so beautiful. And two of the great painters from the Hudson Valley, we've looked at before when we've looked at um, painters who have something to show us for landscape. One of them, of course, is Thomas Cole, and the other is Frederick Evans Church, and we've looked at him, and among his, his paintings are these phenomenally beautiful panoramas, and these are big paintings. These are really huge. One of them we looked at in Five Artists to Study for Landscape uh, was his Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives that he did in 1870. So how can we successfully create a panorama without a lot of distortion? The first thing you have to consider is the idea of a nodal point. Now, you can you can do this yourself and see the difference. If you hold your finger out and put it over a spot in the distance, close one eye and just move your head around, you'll see that the spot and your finger don't move relative to one another because you're using just your one eye and you're pivoting at the nodal point in your eye where it converges. Now, if you want to see the difference, do the same thing, now switch eyes and you'll see that the point in the distance and your finger are now separated one from another. So when you're doing panoramas and you pivot at the nodal point of the lens, these elements relative to each other and to our picture plane do not change, just like they don't change when you're looking with one eye. Now, if you 
pivot your camera at the base. In other words, the lens is here, the camera is here, and you're pivoting about the base of the camera. You're basically doing what happens when you switch eyes because you are moving the modal, the nodal point of the lens. So if, here's our shot looking straight on, the red dot and the blue dot. If you pivot at the base of the camera, the red dot and the blue dot are going to change relative to each other and relative to the, to the image plane. Same thing if you go in the other direction. So how can you achieve a panorama without having this issue? Well, one way is to use a perspective control lens. And when people have asked me, and they do often, what is the best lens to use? One of the reasons that I say to, to use a perspective control lens is because it has the ability to shift without changing the nodal point, and it gives you the opportunity of taking a shot, taking another, taking another, and blending them together into a bigger shot that you couldn't get with just one single view. And here's a good example. This is at the um, Library of Congress. Here's one shot with my 24 millimeter lens, but I wanted to get this other detail. So all I did, I took my shot and then shifted my lens up and that doesn't change the nodal point. It just shifts the lens and I was able to get this bigger view. Here's, here are a couple of other examples. This is at the Biltmore in South Carolina. My my 24 millimeter lens took this much and I shifted it to get this additional piece. Now, if I had used a 17 millimeter lens from that very point, I would have gotten a lot more information, but I would have had a lot of distortion to deal with. Same thing here from the white line down is my main shot with a 24, I shifted my lens and I got this additional part of the room. And here at a townhouse that Borges Architects did, here's my first shot up to here, and then here's the second shot. And I talked about this one in particular when we talked about layering. Now, this is a really wide view of this garden. Here's my first shot here. Now I've cropped out the excess foreground and I've taken a shot to the right and to the left and put them together into one image. Now I can do this successfully without distortion with a perspective control lens. Here's another way to do that. You, you, if you don't have a perspective control lens, you can use a panoramic tripod head. Your camera goes here and it can move up and down side to side, almost like your, your um, perspective control lens. You're moving your camera, but you're not changing the nodal point. You're simply changing what your camera sees. It's like moving your head while you're looking with your finger lined up in the distance. You're not changing eyes, you're just shifting your camera. So th this particular one is kind of expensive because you can just put your camera here and it moves in both directions. Here's a less expensive one called lit a rail nodal slide. And this basically works the same way. You put your camera here and you simply slide it along this rail. Note you're not pivoting your camera at the base. So everything remains the same. Everything out in front of you relative to one another and relative to your um, sensor all stay exactly the same. So if you don't have a perspective control lens and you don't want to invest in one of these rails, if you're going to do a lot of panoramic views, you probably should consider investing in one of these. An alternative is to instead of using a wide angle lens, use more in the telephoto range, 75, 85, 105, back up and zoom in on the various parts of your vista that's in front of you and put them together with photo merge. And the way that photo merge works is you take one picture I have this here in vertical format. You take one shot and you can pivot your camera 
to take your second shot, but you include one third of your original shot in your new shot. So here's my original picture. I've got this little business over here and I include that in this shot to the left. I go to the right, I take this little piece and I make sure that that piece is included in my shot. So here's a middle shot, left and right. I'm going to end up with this photograph of uh, Concourse J out at Miami International Airport. Here's another example. Here's my main shot. One shot to the left and I'm including one third this as the right hand side. I'm taking one third from the left and including it here. I go back, you have to remember what your middle shot is. I go to the right and again, I'm including one third. I take another shot, I'm including one third here so that I end up with taking these five photographs. I'm going to open them up in bridge and I'm going to try to get comparable exposures. Now, as you turn, the sky might be bit brighter in one area than the rest of them. You need to uh, try to get as close as you can. You're going to bring them all into camera raw, select them all and then correct for chromatic aberration, basic color and basic exposure and do that for all of them at the same time, especially chromatic aberration because it, it shifts the uh, image. Then you can select individual files and fine tune each exposure. For example, here I had to darken the sky a little bit to make it compatible with everything else. Then open these in Photoshop. Don't do anything else. Don't start correcting verticals. Don't do anything else to these five. You need to do the photo merge to make your one big picture before you start to toy around with the rest of the image. So in Photoshop, you select file, automate, photo merge, and you will get this dialog box. Under you click on add open files under layout auto under click blend images together and then click OK. And you're going to get something that looks like this. Now the edges probably aren't going to be perfect because if you've turned your camera at the base of the camera rather than at the nodal point, you are going to pick up a little bit of extraneous material on the side. You just go through and crop this out carefully. Look at it at 100% before you do anything because you may have to do a little bit of extra tweaking, especially where the images come together. So here are my five images, one, two, three, four, five. Note the overlaps here and here's my final image. Now you can do panoramas with your iPhone and in fact there is an iPhone a bit, it says pano that you can do this. You shoot it and if you're going to do this, it is best for any of your iPhone work that you're going to do with seriousness for your architectural photography presentations. Put your camera, put your iPhone on a tripod, please, especially for something like this. Shoot in vertical format. Keep the iPhone perfectly level as you pan and the iPhone has a little guide there that you try to keep it level, pan slowly, and in post-production, correct any distortions that often occur at, throughout the image. Now, this is uh, one of my students, Josefina Caceres. This is an uncorrected street scene. She wanted to get this whole street, but just couldn't back up far enough. So this is the uncorrected view and this is taking it into Photoshop and correcting it with warp. She has her vertical straight across. She's taken this horrible curve out of there, flattened this out. And that's a that's a pretty acceptable photograph. Here are a couple of mine that I took keeping church in my mind and uh, coal. I, when I was in the Hudson Valley, here are a couple of my uh, panoramas. Again, keeping church in my mind. There's another one with a, a sunset. And I thought it'd be interesting to see three of my students because I do have them do photo merge as one of the assignments just so they learn how to do that. None of them have perspective control lenses. They don't have uh, nodal sliders. They have to do this all 
with their regular camera and their lens, or some of them do with an iPhone. These were all done with a camera. Here's Lauren Elia's Miami Skyline. Zach Cronin also did a Miami Skyline. And uh, Jack Kazat did this street scene in Wynwood. So this is something that takes a little practice. Go out and, and try this. Go out and, and shoot some. Keep in mind that if it's right up on top of you, you get more distortion. So as it, if it's further back, you can use a zoom lens, zoom in. I have a 24 to 105 zoom that I use for landscape. I use that for my uh, panoramas when I can't get it with a perspective control lens. So try it out and I think it will, it will save you when you're in a situation where you simply have no other choice. But knowing that you can do this technique, you can plan ahead. So if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, if you're new, please, we want to welcome you. Please subscribe to the channel and let your friends who are in this field or interested in architectural photography, let them know that the channel exists. All the YouTube videos are free. We intend to keep it that way. Um, you can support the site by going to stephenbrookphotography.com. I have a 360 page ebook on architectural photography and composition. Everything in that book will help you with your work. And every page is, you can download it and then copy anything in there. A lot of people like to just copy out the workflows that are in there. There are dozens of workflows. So please give that a thought. If you want to jumpstart your work, if you're already involved in this and want to fill in some of the gaps in your, in your knowledge, I promise you there isn't anything that you could ask that isn't covered in the book. And the book is a great um, addition to using the videos. So I'm glad from everything I've heard and from everything that you've told me that the book is helping you with your work and the YouTube videos are helping and I'm really happy to know that. So thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you again soon.